Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's good to be back. It's good to be back in Virginia. To my great friend and one of my national co-chairs, Tim Kaine, you have the one of the finest governors and one of the finest people in public office right here. Give a big round of applause to Tim Kaine. <laughs> to one of the best governors of the past, who will soon be one of the best United States senators of the future, give it up for Mark Warner. We are so proud of the work he's done. I'm looking forward to being on the ticket with Mark Warner. I want to I wanna just hang on to his coattails here in Virginia. He is outstanding. I, I want to thank my great friend and great supporter, uh, not only a wonderful governor, but now the mayor of this great city, Doug Wilder. Give Doug Wilder a big round of applause. To somebody who has already shown himself to be uh, an outstanding senator, but also somebody with a conscience, somebody with convictions, and somebody who has the courage of his convictions. He's not here tonight, but I want you to know I am so proud to be serving with United States Senator Jim Webb. Give Jim Webb a big round of applause. I want to thank the congressman of this district, a great friend, Bobby Scott, a great supporter. I want to thank Jim Moran from Northern Virginia, a wonderful congressman and a great friend. Rick Boucher, who's not here, I, I commend him for all the outstanding work he's doing, to Dick Cranwall, uh, the Democratic Party chairman, and to Amy Rieger. Congratulations, Amy, on all the great work that you have been doing. Uh, I know you are going to be missed, but we appreciate your service to the great state of Virginia great Commonwealth of Virginia. Now, it has, it has been, it has been one year since we began this campaign for the presidency on the steps of the old state capitol in Springfield, Illinois. Just me and about 15,000 of my closest friends. And at the time, there weren't too many who imagined we'd be standing where we are today. I knew, I knew I wouldn't necessarily be Washington's favorite candidate. I knew we wouldn't get all the big donors or all the endorsements right off the bat. Uh, I knew that I'd be the underdog in every contest from January to June. I knew it wouldn't be easy. But then something started to happen. As we met people in their living rooms and on their farms and churches and town hall meetings and VFW halls, they all started to tell a similar story about the state of our politics today. Whether they're young or old, black or white, Latino or Asian, Democrat, Independent or Republican, the message is the same. We are tired of being disappointed by our politics. We are tired of being let down. We're tired of hearing promises made and 10-point plans proposed in the heat of a campaign, only to have nothing change when everyone goes back to Washington because the lobbyists write another check or because politicians start worrying about how they'll win the next election instead of why they should win the next election or because they focus on who's up and who's down instead of who matters whether we're lifting our children up, whether we're supporting our seniors, whether we're doing right by our veterans. And while Washington is consumed with the same drama and divisions and distraction, another family puts up a for sale sign in their front yard. Another factory shuts its doors forever. Another mother declares bankruptcy because she couldn't pay her child's medical bills and another soldier waves goodbye 
as he leaves on another tour of duty in a war that should have never been authorized and should have never been waged. And it goes on and on and on and on. And we become cynical. We conclude this is the best we can do. We turn away from politics. Our standards become lower. But in this election, at this moment, Americans are standing up all across the country to say, not this time, not this year. The stakes are too high and the challenges are too great to play the same old Washington games with the same old Washington players and expect a different result. People want to turn the page. They want to write a new chapter in American history. And today, and today, the voters from the West Coast to the Gulf Coast to the heart of America stood up to say, yes, we can. We won in Louisiana. We won in Nebraska. We won in Washington State. We won north, we won south, we won in between. And I believe that we can win Virginia on Tuesday if you're ready to stand for change. Now, I understand that some of the excitement doesn't have to do with me. I know that whatever else happens, whatever twists and turns this campaign may take, when you go into that polling place next November, the name George Bush won't be on the ballot, and that makes everybody pretty cheerful. Everybody's happy about that. The name of my cousin, Dick Cheney, who won't be on the ballot. <laughs> that, was, that was embarrassing when that news came out. You know, when they do these genealogical surveys, you want to be related to somebody cool. <laughs> so, but his name won't be on the ballot. So each of us running for the Democratic nomination agrees on one thing that the other party does not, that the next president must end the disastrous policies of George W. Bush. No more Scooter Libby justice. No more Brownie incompetence. No more Karl Rove politics. We are going to have a different kind of politics here in America. We all agree on that. Both Senator Clinton and I have put forth detailed plans and good ideas that would do just that. Uh, and I've said before and I say again, Senator Clinton was my friend before this race started. She will be my friend after this race started. We are going to be unified as Democrat, whoever the nominee, to make sure that we bring an end to the failed policies of George W. Bush. That we can guarantee. But I'm running for president because I believe that to actually make that happen, to make this time different from all the rest, we need a leader who can finally move beyond the divisive politics of Washington and bring Democrats, independents, and yes, Republicans who are disillusioned with our current course together to get things done. That's how we are going to win this election. That's how we will win in Virginia, and that's how we will change this country when I am President of the United States of America. This week, this week we found out that the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party will be Senator John McCain. Now, I believe John McCain is a good man and he is a genuine American hero and we honor his half-century of service to this nation. 
But understand that in this campaign, this year, he has made the decision to embrace the failed policies of George Bush's Washington. He speaks of a hundred-year war in Iraq. He sees another on the horizon with Iran. He once opposed George Bush's tax cuts for the wealthiest few who don't need them and didn't even ask for them. He said they were too expensive and unwise, that we should never cut taxes for the wealthy at a time of war. And he was absolutely right then. But somewhere along the line, the wheels came off the Straight Talk Express because he now supports the very same tax cuts he voted against. This is what happens when you spend too long in Washington. Politics, politicians end up not saying what they mean, and they don't mean what they say. And that is why, in this election, our party can't stand for business as usual in Washington. The Democratic Party must stand for change, not change as a slogan, not change as a bumper sticker, but change we can believe in. That's what this campaign is all about. This fall, this fall, we owe the American people a real choice. It's a choice between debating John McCain about who has the most experience in Washington or debating him about who's most likely to change Washington, because that's a debate that we can win. It's a choice between debating John McCain about lobbying reform with a nominee who has taken more money from lobbyists than he has or doing it with a campaign that hasn't taken a dime of their money because we've been funded by you, the American people. It's a choice between taking on John McCain with Republicans and independents who are already united against us or running against him with a campaign that's uniting Americans of all parties around a common purpose. There is a reason why the last six polls in a row show that I'm the strongest candidate against John McCain, because I've done better among independents in almost every single contest we've had. That's why we won more red states and swing states that the next Democratic nominee needs to win in November. We need to win. America needs us to win. Virginia Democrats know how important this is. That's how Mark Warner won this state. That's how Tim Kaine won this state. That is how Jim Webb won this state. And if I'm your nominee, that's how I will win this state. to make clear that this election is not between regions or religions or genders. It's not about rich versus poor or young versus old. It's not about black versus white. It's about the past versus the future. The Republicans in Washington are already running on the politics of yesterday, which is why our party must be the party of tomorrow. And that is the party I intend to lead as President of the United States of America. I know, I know what it takes to pass health care reform because I've done it. Not by demonizing anyone who disagrees with me, but by bringing Democrats and Republicans together to provide health insurance to 150,000 children and parents in Illinois. And when I am President of the United States, we are going to pass universal health care, not in 20 years, not in 10 years, but by the end of my first term as President of the United States of America. You don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to take my word for it. Senator Ted Kennedy recently said that he wouldn't have endorsed me if he didn't believe passionately that I will fight for universal health care as president. And he knows a little something about health care. My plan would bring premiums down for the typical family by $2,500 per year. 
We'd ban insurance companies from excluding people from coverage because of pre-existing conditions. We'd allow every American to get the same health care I have as a member of Congress. And I know and I know that Senator Clinton likes to point out the difference between our health care plans. There is a real difference here because Senator Clinton has said that the only way to provide universal health care is to say that we will go after your wages if you don't buy health care. Well, I believe the reason people don't have health care isn't because they can't afford it, isn't because they don't want to buy it, it's because they can't afford it. And that is why my plan does more to reduce costs than any other plan out there. That's how we're going to make sure that every single American has the health care that they need, and we're going to do it by the end of my first term. It's also, it's also time to bring the cost of living down for working families who are struggling in this economy like never before. They're facing rising costs and falling wages. And we owe it to them to end the Bush-McCain tax cuts for the wealthiest 2 percent and put a tax cut into the pockets of families who really need them. That's what I did in Illinois when I brought Democrats and Republicans together to provide millions of dollars in tax relief for working families and the working poor. That's the kind of tax relief I intend to provide when I'm President of the United States of America. I will end the tax breaks for companies who ship jobs overseas and give middle class tax breaks to 95 percent of working Americans and homeowners who are struggling and seniors who deserve to retire with dignity and respect. And I won't wait another 10 years to raise the minimum wage in this country. I will raise it to keep pace with inflation every year because I believe that if you work in this country, you should not be poor. That is a basic principle of fairness in the United States of America, and I will uphold it when I am president. It's time to give every child everywhere a world-class education from the day they are born till the day they graduate from college. I am only here today because somebody somewhere gave my father a ticket to come study in America, because somebody gave my mother the opportunity to go to graduate school, because even though we didn't have much growing up, I got scholarships to go to some of the best schools in this country. That's the chance I believe that every child in America should have. And when I am president, we are going to give every child the best education we have to offer. We're going to invest in early childhood education to close the achievement gap. We're not going to just going to talk about how great teachers are. We will reward them for their greatness by giving them higher salaries and giving them more support. We will maintain the highest standards for our kids because our children have to be able to compete in that global economy that Mark Warner talked about. But we also have to make sure we are not having teachers teach to the test because I want our students learning art and music and science and poetry and all the things that make an education worthwhile. And I don't know about you, but I think it's time we make college affordable. I'm going to have a $4,000 tuition credit for every student, $4,000 for every student every year so they're not loaded up with debt before they graduate. But it won't come for free. Students, young people, you will have to give back in national service. You'll have to work in a homeless shelter for a few hours or a veterans home or join the Peace Corps, join the Nat Foreign Service. We will invest in you. You will invest in America. Together, we will march forward and go into the 21st century when I'm President of the United States. When I am president, this party will be the party that finally makes sure our sons and daughters don't grow up in a century where our economy is weighed down by our addiction to oil. Our foreign policy is held hostage to a whim of dictators. And our planet passes a moment of no return. When I called for higher fuel efficiency standards, I didn't do it in front of some environmental group in California. 
I did it in front of the automakers in Detroit. And I have to admit, I have to admit the room was really quiet. <laughs> Nobody clapped. But we need, that's okay because we need leadership that will tell the American people not just what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. We'll tell the American people the truth. We'll be honest with them. And that's the kind of president I intend to be. I will set the goal of 80 percent reductions in carbon emissions by 2050. And we will meet it with higher fuel standards and new investments in renewable fuels that will create millions of new jobs and entire new industries right here in the United States of America. And finally, it is time to turn the page on eight years of a foreign policy that has made us less safe and less respected in the world. I am looking forward to having a debate with John McCain about foreign policy. Because if I'm the nominee, the American people will have a clear cho choice. John McCain will not be able to say that I supported the war in Iraq. He won't be able to say that I su supported giving George Bush the benefit of the doubt on Iran. He won't be able to say that I follow the Bush-Cheney doctrine of not talking to leaders that we don't like, not talking to countries we don't like, because I recall what John F. Kennedy said. He said, we should never negotiate out of fear, but we should never fear to negotiate. Strong countries and strong presidents talk to their adversaries and tell them where America stands. And that's what I intend to do as President of the United States of America. I will end this war in Iraq. I will bring our troops home, but I will also end the mindset that got us into war. We have been engulfed by a politics of fear for too long, where 9-11 is used as a way to scare up boats instead of a way to bring us together around a common purpose to defeat a common enemy. That will change when I am president. So Democrats, this is our moment. This is our time for change. Our party, the Democratic Party, has always been at its best when we led not by polls, but by principles, not by calculation, but by conviction, when we summoned the entire nation around a higher purpose, a common purpose. We are the party of Jefferson, who wrote the words that we're still trying to heed, that all of us are created equal, that all of us deserve the chance to pursue our happiness. We're the party of Jackson, who took back the White House for the people of this country. We're a party of a man who overcame his own disability to tell us that the only thing we had to fear was fear itself, who faced down fascism and liberated a continent from tyranny. We are of the party of a young president who asked us what we could do for our country and challenged us to do it. That is who we are. That is who we are. And I know sometimes when I talk like this, people say, oh, he's so idealistic. He's so naive. He's a hope monger. <laughs> I've heard this criticism lately that I'm peddling false hopes, that I need a reality check. The notion is that somehow, if you're realistic, then you set your sights lower. That if you talk about hope, that somehow you must be passive and have your head in the clouds and just wait for things to happen to you. I have to remind people that's not what hope is. It's true, I talk about hope a lot. I have to, the odds of me being here aren't very high. to a mother. I was born to a teen mom. My dad left me when I was two. I was raised by my single mom and my grandparents, and they didn't have a lot of money. They had, didn't have a lot of status. They could give me love and education and hope. 
And so I do. I, I put hope on my signs. I put, I spoke about hope at the Democratic Convention. I wrote a book called The Audacity of Hope. But, but I, need to under, I need to explain, people, hope is not blind optimism. Hope is not ignorance of the challenges that lie before us. I know how hard it will be to provide health care to everybody. The insurance of the drug companies aren't going to give up their profits easily. I know how hard it will be to change our energy policy. ExxonMobil made $11, million, $11 billion this past quarter. I know how hard it is to alleviate poverty that has built up over generations. I know how hard it is to make sure that we're lifting up our schools because it's not just going to involve teachers, not just going to involve administrators, it will involve parents and communities changing our mindset about our children. I know these things because I fought on the streets as a community organizer. I have fought in the courts as a civil rights attorney. I have fought in the legislature, and I've won some fights, but I've lost some too. I've seen good legislation die because good intentions were not enough, because they weren't fortified with political will or political power. I've seen how this country's judgment has been clouded sometimes by fear and division, how we've been made to be afraid of each other, afraid of immigrants, afraid of gays, afraid of people who don't look like us. I know how hard change is. But I also know this, that nothing worthwhile in this country has ever happened except somebody somewhere was willing to hope. That That's how this country was founded, by a group of patriots declaring independence against the mighty British Empire. Nobody gave them a chance. That's how slaves and abolitionists resisted a wicked system. How a, how a president was able to chart a course to ensure we would not remain half slave and half free. That is how the greatest generation defeated fascism and lifted itself up out of a Great Depression. That is how pioneers struck west. That's how immigrants arrived from distant shores. That's how women won the right to vote. That's how workers won the right to organize. That's how young people traveled south to march and sit in, and some died for freedom's cause. That's what hope is. That's what hope is. Virginia, that is what hope is. Imagining Imagining and then fighting for, working for what did not seem possible before. And this is our moment. This is our chance. You know, there, there, there's, a moment, there's a moment in the life of every generation where that spirit of hopefulness has to come through, where we cast aside the fear and the doubt and the cynicism, the cynicism that so often passes for wisdom but is actually just being afraid to reach for something higher, where we shed that and arm in arm, we decide we are going to remake this country block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, county by county, state by state. Virginia, this is our moment. This is our time. And if you will stand with me on Tuesday, if you will vote for me on Tuesday, then we will not just win the primary in Virginia. We will win this nomination, and we will win the general election. And you and I together, we will transform this country, and we will transform the world. Thank you. God bless you.